copyrighted program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. San Francisco police calling all cars, attention all cars. Investigate a bombing at the Saints Peter and Paul Church on Filbert Street. Get over there right away, that's all. coming men who do things invariably prefer Rio Grande cracked gasoline. Police officers like those portrayed in the following drama are of this type, courageous, quick to make decisions, quick to act. When they get a call from headquarters, they have to jam down the throttle and go. More police officers use Rio Grande cracked gasoline wherever it is sold than any other brand. Los Angeles, Oakland, Maricopa County, Arizona, and many, many other cities and counties throughout California, Nevada, and Arizona choose Rio Grande Cracked Gasoline. And they chose Rio Grande Cracked Gasoline after official competitive tests and now use it month after month in all police cars, fire engines, ambulances, and other emergency equipment. Doesn't that mean something to you? Rio Grande Cracked Gasoline starts quicker accelerates faster and delivers far more power and speed because it is refined by the famous Sinclair cracking process. It is the only gasoline you can buy that is refined by this patented process. So, if you are the vigorous, hard-hitting type who likes to do things, fill up your tank with Rio Grande cracked gasoline and enjoy the satisfaction of police car performance. After this thrilling crime drama to be enacted immediately, you will hear another announcement that presents a worthwhile opportunity. Wait for it. Meanwhile, remember, for police car performance, use Rio Grande Cracked Gasoline. We take you now to our San Francisco studios, where you will hear Sheriff Hollenberry, San Francisco County. Sheriff Hollenberry. Good evening. It has almost been 10 years since the bombing of the Saints Peter's and Paul Church in the section of San Francisco known as Little Italy. Yet San Francisco has not forgotten the work of Chief Dan O'Brien and his men in bringing to an end the reign of terror that gripped the citizens of that district. Five different times the Phantom Bomber left his deadly package of dynamite on the steps of the church. Four times his attack was successful. What happened on his fifth visit will be told in a moment in the true dramatization you are about to hear. Before we return you to Los Angeles, however, I should like to say that we of San Francisco are proud of the crime prevention record we have, and especially in the case of the Saints, Peters, and Paul bombing. The solution of that case was a fine piece of police work. Saturday night in San Francisco. In Little Italy, there are no sounds of gaiety, no late parties. For tomorrow is the feast day of St. Francis de Sales. From somewhere deep in the interior of the church of Saints Peter and Paul on Gilbert Street, the deep tones of a clock strike 11. Victor Graffero, the sexton, stands surveying the result of his efforts toward decorating the altar. There is no sound other than the clock to disturb the peace and quiet of the moment. Then, suddenly... An earth-shaking explosion shatters the silence. Its deep throated roar echoing and re-echoing through the nave of the church. Priceless stained glass windows crash to the floor. Faster rain from the walls and ceiling. In one split second, the interior of the church becomes a shambles. Lights suddenly flash on. Half clad Italians rush out into the street, fear lurking in their eyes, memories of the great quake of 1906, striking sudden terror to their hearts. Then, as suddenly as it began, a deep silence. Griffero, dazed and shaken by the explosion, slowly rises from the floor, stumbles to the back door, out onto the wet cobblestones of the alley. To him, it is altogether too clear what has happened. 
Someone has bombed his church. And as he stands there, the rain splattering down on his bare head, he breathes a quiet prayer of thanks for his escape. And in police headquarters, the scene is one of complete confusion. Hundreds of calls from terrified residents of the neighborhood pour in through the switchboard. Sleepy-eyed policemen snap into sudden action. Sirens screaming police cars roar to the scene of the explosion. But upon their arrival, detectives learn nothing that might lead to the bomber. There is no single clue that can be followed. All agree that it's the work of some madman, perhaps some religious fanatic, but nowhere is there a lead as to his identity. And after weeks of inquiry, questioning of hundreds of suspicious characters found in the neighborhood, the investigation slowly cools off. The world forgets the bombing of the St. Peter and Paul Church. Peace and quiet is restored to the Italy. Four months later, 3.22 Sunday morning, with no warning, the mad bomber strikes again. And again, as on that wet evening four months before, terror strikes the heart of the Italy. The police are again requested to find the fiend responsible. And as before, there is no trace of him, nothing to work on. Five months later, another explosion rocks the district. And three months after that, another, and this time more powerful one, tears great ragged holes in the sidewalk, smashes the great door to splinters. following morning, Chief of Police O'Brien summons ten of his most trusted detectives to his office. Men, I'm going to place you on a secret detail. You must tell absolutely no one what it is. Upon that one thing depends the success of the whole plan. Are you willing to be sworn into this trust? Yes, I am. Yes, sir. Good. Now, you're all familiar with the fact that the St. Peter's and Paul Church has been bombed four times in the last year. You also know that so far, in spite of all our inquiries... We have no suspects. In fact, we know just about as much as we did when it happened the first time. Now, the job I'm going to give you men is just this. Stop those bombings. We can't risk another one. How do we do it, Chief? I'll explain the details to Captain Lane. He can pass them on to you and work out the assignments. Well, now, the plan depends, as Chief O'Brien said, primarily on the fact that no one knows about it. By that, I mean no one, and that doesn't exempt your wives. My wife like that. Boys, that's going to be the hardest part of your job. <laughs> well, now to be serious, here's the idea. You ten men are going to be stationed at four different points in and near the church. You're going to take your posts, and you're going to stay there every night until you nab the fellow who's doing this. And if he doesn't show up? He will. There's no reason to suppose he'll stop until he's completed his mission, and that won't be until the church is in complete ruins. I don't think you'll have to wait very long for him, though. The time between each visit has been shorter. He's getting impatient. A good thing, incidentally. It's liable to make him careless. I hope he doesn't get careless as one of those bombs. I understand they carry quite a wallop. <laughs> well, the idea is to get him before he gets you, which makes this job dangerous. So dangerous that I'm going to give every one of you a chance to pull out now with no hard feelings. How about it? Oh, oh, no, 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 no. Well, that settles it, then. Now, we have established four watching points. One in the apartment across from the church, commanding a view of the entire street. Another one in the upstairs window of the church. And one just inside the front door of the church. And the last, which will be the headquarters, is in the parish house next door. There will be telephone communication between each of these four points with the buzzer. Each station will have a buzzer number. And when you hear your number, you answer your phone. If you hear a buzzer that isn't your number, listen in any way and hear what's going on. Now, tonight, you men will go to your posts. And from that time on until you catch the bomber, it's up to you. Are there any questions? Good. McInerney? Yes, sir. You can pass for a priest, so you let the boys in. Now, here's the key to the parish house. And tonight at midnight, you go through the front door of the church and let the boys in the back way. And then proceed directly to your various stations and keep your eyes open. I think that covers everything. Well... Oh, uh, one thing I forgot. Joe Wickstrom. Yes, sir? I've got a special job for you and one that's right up your alley. Now, Chief O'Brien and I figured if the bomber didn't see any guard at the church, he'd get suspicious and beat it. So you're going to be it. 
You're going to dress up in full uniform and parade up and down in front. Then why the rest of the boys? Well, I'm getting to that. <laughs> you won't be a very efficient guard. In fact, you'll be the sort of a guard that the chief here would break if he saw you. Uh-huh. I think I began to understand. Sure. Your main function will be to parade up and down for a couple of hours each night and then get tired or something and apparently sneak away for a nap. You think up some good gag to get out of the way. You've got a reputation on the force for being a clown. Now, here's your chance to make some use of it. So don't let me down. Thus, at exactly 12 midnight the same evening, Detective McInerney slips silently into the church, makes his way to the extreme back, finds his companions waiting in the alleyway. All right, all right, boss. Come on, man. Hey, keep quiet. You got any kind of a light so we can see where we're going? Kendra's yeah. good to it. We'll just have to be plenty careful and pick our way along the aisle here. I think I can lead the way. Well, I hope so. I can't see an inch in front of me. Yeah, you and me both, Joe. The main thing is to watch the pews along the aisle here. If you can sort of feel your way along without stumbling on them, you'll be all right. Everyone's in, Larry. Shall I shut the door? Yeah. And watch it doesn't squeak on you. It did. No, that's all right. No one can hear that. Come on, now, follow me. When we get to the front, we'll split and go to our stations. I'll lead on. Okay. We're with you. All right. Careful, Larry. Careful, Larry. Come on, quiet, quiet, boys. Take your time. Yeah. Come here, this guy. Look out. All right, all right. Hold it. This is where we separate. You all know your stations? Yeah, sure we do. Good. Why don't you go through the door here and up the stairs? Window's right at the top of it. Right. Uh, to meet you and Tom, that door over there leads to the parish house. The priest will show you the window. Good enough. Let's go, Tom. Ed, you and Greminger here. There's the phone and the buzzer right by the door. Do we now go up this way? As soon as we get to our station, we'll buzz and check the phone system. Okay, Larry. Keep those eyes peeled. Don't worry. I haven't any more desire to get blown out of here than you have. So long. See you in the morning, if everything goes well. Right. Come on, Dewey. Yeah. Easy now. Just keep close to me. That's it. So, this is to be our happy little home, huh? Nice roomy spot. Yeah, it's cramped, all right. Well, at least it'll keep us from getting sleepy at the wrong time. That's something. Yeah. You gonna buzz the phone? Yeah, right now. I hope it works. Remager, station one. Hello, Joe. McInerney speaking. Just making a check on the phones. Hang up and see if you can hear the others as I ring them. Okay, Larry. Ring ahead. Matty speaking, station two. Hello, to Matty. McInerney speaking. Testing the phone. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, fine. Clear as a bell. Good. Hang on and listen while I check the other stations. See if you can hear us. Right. What's up? Just checking phones, that's all. Great idea. These phones makes everything hunky-dory. Yeah, as long as they work. Seems here. Wait a minute. Let me listen. Station three. McInerney, testing phones. Sounds fine here. Good. Keep the phone open. Okay, Larry. I can hear the others talking on the line. Anything, Dylan? No, just testing. Lennon, station four. Okay, Lennon. McInerney, testing the phone. Yeah, there's Lennon over at four. Everything's fine here, Larry. Okay. I'm going to ring off now. Keep your eyes open. Don't worry. If the rest of you stations can hear me, check back as soon as I hang up. Start with one and follow in numerical order. That's all. Keep your eyes on the street, Tom. i got to check back with Larry as soon as station one is finished. Okay. There's Greminger up at one ringing. McInerney, station five. Greminger at one, checking back. Okay, Joe, that's all. Right. I'm going to buzz Larry. So, one after another, the five stations check and recheck the elaborate phone communicative system. Find all in perfect working order. Settle down to the long vigil ahead of them. And in the street outside the church, Detective Joe Wickstrom paces slowly up and down to all observers an obviously tired guard, not too enthusiastic over his job. What a job, walking around by myself like a night watchman. Hmm. One o'clock and all's well along the Filbert Street front. What a life. Good evening, officer. Cold enough, are you? Yeah, plenty cold. You've certainly had a lonely job here. 
If I don't envy you at all. All a part of the nice work, ma'am. I got to admit, I've known better jobs. You watching the church? Yes, sir, that's the main idea. But just between you and me and the lamppost, I don't see much sense to it. <clears throat> it seems to me there's a lot of sense to it, officer. What with all the bombings and all that's been going on, about time the police did something about it. That's what the chief says. Maybe he's right. I still don't see the idea. <clears throat> well, come along, my dear. We can't stand here all night talking to an officer. Good night. Good night, ma'am. Good night. Good night. Good night. <clears throat> Not a very conscientious officer, if you were to ask me. He didn't seem overly enthusiastic about his work, did he? That's the trouble with this police force. And the men are lax, inefficient. Now, when I was in the George, army... Was a... look back at that officer. Is that a flask he's holding in his hand? What? By heavens, I believe it is. He's drinking from it. An officer on duty, openly drinking. Why, I never heard of anything so disgraceful in all my life. Hmm, I have a good mind to report him. I think you'd be in the right, too, George. After all, we do pay taxes and things that go for their salary. We do, we do indeed. Matter of fact, I not only have a mind to report him, I think I will. Come along, my dear. I shall telephone from the first available place. Thus, so well does actor detective Joe Wickstrom, with his coffee-filled flask, carry out his role of slip-shot guard the very first night a complaint is phoned into headquarters. And so it goes, night after night of nerve-wracking watching, days spent at home sleeping. In the minds of each of the ten men, one single thought, get the bomber and end the vigil. But the nights drag on, and no attempt is made to bomb the church. Six, seven, eight, Nine nights, still no alarm to break the monotony of the ten weary men's vigil. It is the tenth evening of constant surveillance. In the apartment across from the church, Detective Sidney Du Bois and James Simseri sit, staring into the empty street, lighting cigarettes one after the other, striving to keep alert. Ten nights. Ten nights of just sitting and staring out that window. Enough to drive a guy screw. Oh, take it easy, Sid. We may be here for ten more, or even ten more after that. I hope not. It's getting so I imagine I see things out there in the street. My eyes are beginning to play tricks on me. You better see if you can't grab a snooze. I'll keep watching. No, no, no. I, I'll be all right. Just the nerves jumping around in me. You got another cigarette? Sure. Help yourself. Thanks. I'll get a light off this bus. I know how you feel, Sid. I'm getting jumpy myself lately. You know, I could have sworn I saw somebody over by the church door a few minutes back. Then when I got ready to ask you to look, I... <laughs> I couldn't see anything anymore. Gives you a funny feeling in your inside, doesn't it? Mm, you said it. Makes you want to get up and yell all of a sudden. Only that wouldn't be such a good... What's the matter? Shh, wait a minute. See someone? I think so. Look down the street there. Is that someone coming this way? Or... Yeah. Keep your eyes on him. I'm going to Buzz McInerney. What's he doing? Still coming this way. Looks like he's carrying something under his coat. McInerney. Suspicious character approaching church. Be on your guard. Right. Keep me posted. He's heading across the street for the church. Watch it, Larry. He's heading for the front door. We're ready. Can't see him from here yet. Rapid, you're speaking. Station one. We're ready here. Good. He's out the steps. Okay, I'm sorry. I can see him now. I've got a gun on him. Shall we bust out and nab him? No. When we see what he does. He's, he's going up the steps. You'd better nab him before something happens. You'd better nab him. Easy, Sid. Larry has a gun on him. But if he has a bomb there, he'll blow the boys to bits. He's, he's liable to let it go any second. Easy, easy. Look, look he's kneeling down. Looks like he's praying or something. Relax, boys. It's a false alarm. Uh, Larry says it's a false alarm. Yeah. The guy's just kneeling there praying. Let me look. Whew. Yeah, there he is getting up. He's leaving. Man, what a start that gave me. Hey, you and me both, Sid. I think my heart stopped for good. So the first activity in ten nights turns out to be no more than a devout Catholic stopping to offer his prayers. Nerves stretched to the breaking point suddenly ease off. Faces lose their mask-like expressions. Silence settles on the five stations once again. Days 
become weeks, weeks become months, and still the ten detectives stay at their posts. And as the weeks drag by in each man's heart, the conviction becomes stronger. The phantom bomber has disappeared. If you ask me, the guy decided he'd done enough damage and left town. Maybe the phantom bomber's wise to the trap we've set. This business is getting on my nerves. Why doesn't he bring his bomb and get it over with? My eyes are playing tricks. I thought I saw something. It can't go on much longer. My wife's going to leave me if something doesn't happen soon. Thoughts running crazily through tired minds. Bodies aching from cramped positions. And still the endless watch continues. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, the Saturday. In the apartment window across from the church, Simseri and Du Bois listen to the ticking of a clock. Count the ticks as the minutes turn into hours. You awake, Sid? Yeah. <laughs> I couldn't tell you. I haven't moved for an hour. I was listening to the clock. I got it all figured out how many ticks there are to an hour. I'm going to figure out how many there are in a 12-hour day, Nick. Yeah, that is if you don't go bats first. Right. How much is 12 times 7,200? I wouldn't know, Sid. I I never was much at arithmetic. Well, that's how many ticks there are to a day, if I can multiply that far. Then why don't you give the clock up in favor of the spots on the wallpaper? I've counted them five times now, and I get a different answer every time. Why don't we give this whole thing up and start living normal lives again? That's simple. Because we stay here until we get our bomber, friend. Any more questions? Seriously, though, Jimmy. How long do you think this thing is going to last? I can't answer that one. In fact, I've tried not to think about it. It doesn't do any good. If only, if only something would happen. I think I'd even welcome a bomb at this point. Oh, uh, no thanks. Not for this one. I've seen what bombs do to people who get in their way. You know, they don't leave much to take home to Mother. Yeah, I've seen the results of bombs, too. Not very pleasant when you come to think about it. I remember once when I was over on... That's us. Station 3. Cemetery speaking. Keep your eye on the street, Jimmy. There's two men coming this way from Powell Street. You'll be able to spot them in a minute. Okay. A couple of birds coming this way, Sid. Stand by. Right. You on the line, Larry? Sure thing. Keep me posted. Uh, I can't see them yet. Wait a minute. Yeah, now I can. One of them's carrying something. Yeah. I can see it. Hey, Larry. Yes? They're right below me now, and they've stopped. Looks like they're talking together. One of them's starting across the street for the church. Stand by, Larry. One of them's heading for the steps. He's got something under his arm. Watch him, Jimmy. If he starts running, let him have it. Right. He's starting up the steps now. Okay. I see him now. Stand by, Greminger. All stations ready to attack. Slowly, the man in the street starts up the 13 concrete steps. Unaware of the three pairs of eyes glued on him from the church windows, of the two pairs from across the street. Slowly, cautiously, the dark figure edges on deep into the shadows of the church portals. Then, suddenly, he stops, casts a quick look around, then stoops and places a bundle on the concrete. With amazing speed, he strikes a match, applies it to a fuse sticking out of the mysterious bundle, and simultaneously, back in a red throws open the window above, barks a sudden command. Come on, get out of here, Kaufman. Come on. we got to get that bomb before it goes off. The fuse is almost gone. I'll get that. Hey, oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. You get the bomb, Joe? Yeah, just in time, too. Look. Good Lord. An inch more and we'd been blasted off the earth. Yeah, and then some. Let's go over and see that fellow to manage up wing. He's lying in the gutter across the street. Okay. Nice work, boys. You made short work of that other bird. He's dead if they make him. This one's still chicken, though. Well, what was the idea of bombing the church, buddy? I had nothing to do with it. Nothing to do with it at all. And what were you doing with that other bird who had the bomb? I, I was not with him. God sent me here to the church. I, I had nothing to do with it. And uh, he's just crazy alone. I'll, I'll get an ambulance. I'll get picked up. Right. Well, it looks like we put an end to our bombing, friend. Yeah, and I don't mind telling you, I'm not sorry about it. Uh, I guess every one of us feels the same way. But there's one thing about it. In spite of the long wait, it was worth it. Worth every second of it. To get rid of the bomber and put an end to this reign of terror. 
I, for one, say thank the Lord it's over. And I, for one, will now go home and introduce myself to my wife. And now we take you once more to our northern studios, where you will hear District Attorney Matthew Brady of San Francisco County. Mr. Brady. Thus the apprehension, trial, and sentencing of the Phantom Bomber were dispensed with in a few seconds by San Francisco police without further cost to the county. The bullet-riddled corpse was identified as that of G. Ricky, a religious fanatic. His accomplice, the man across the street, died from his wounds a few weeks later, and the police records were closed. The ten detectives whose daring solved the bombings were each given two weeks' vacation by the police commission and a gold badge for distinctive service by Mayor Roth. Once again, the faithful congregation of the Church of Saints Peter and Paul began to climb the 13 steps to worship without fear. Thank you, Mr. Brady. Perhaps these police dramas affect you as they affect this listener who recently wrote in... So many calling all cars programs that now every time I hear a siren, either on the air or on the street, I say to myself, there goes some police car performance. <laughs> I said it jokingly at first, then I tried Rio Grande cracked gasoline myself. Now I'm serious when I say it is absolutely everything you claim it is. No wonder the police cars use it. Every time you hear a siren, a fire engine, or an ambulance, let it remind you, too, that there goes some police car performance and that you can have the very same performance in your car by driving into the Rio Grande Independent Service Station just down the street. There you can get the same Rio Grande cracked gasoline that powers more police cars and other emergency equipment wherever it is sold than any other brand. Your Rio Grande dealer will also give you free a toy police money with your change, which you can trade for junior police badges, handcuffs, fingerprinting sets, bracelets, G-man pistols, and other valuable gifts to make some boy or girl happy, and a full-fledged member of Rio Grande's Junior Police Department. Ask for a copy of Calling All Cars News and learn all about it. This is the opportunity to make some youngster happy without it costing you a cent. As you get acquainted with your Rio Grande dealer, you will discover that he also sells a motor oil as fine as you can buy anywhere on earth, Sinclair, Pennsylvania. It is thoroughly de-waxed and de-jellied in the world's largest refinery, located in the heart of the Bradford Allegheny Field recognized as the source of the best, the most expensive lubricating crude in Pennsylvania. Yet it costs you no more than motor oil refined from cheaper Pennsylvania crude. San Francisco police calling all cars, attention all cars, a cancellation broadcast 152 regarding the bombings of the St. Peter and Paul Church on Filbert Street. Suspect in this case killed while trying to escape. That's all. This is your narrator, Frederick Lindsley, bidding you good night for the Rio Grande Oil Company.